Hello and welcome to another episode of Zenotes Live. Today we will be discussing another chemistry past paper and we have Sarvesh with us. Over to you, Sarvesh. Okay, hi there, I'm Sarvesh and today we will be doing paper 2-1 from May, June 2022. So moving on to the questions. So over here in question one, we are told that calcium, magnesium, radium are group two elements. Radium follows the same trends as the other members of group two. And in part A, we are asked the highest energy orbital, which contains electrons in a calcium atom. So first of all, the energy level of orbitals, it depends on the shell. So like the first will have lesser energy than the second, and second lesser than third, and third will have lesser than fourth. So since calcium lies on the fourth period of the periodic table, its highest energy level will or level will be the fourth level. And calcium is an S block element. So its highest energy orbital is 4S. You can also figure this out by writing out the uh, electronic configuration for calcium, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, and then 4s2. So like 4s2 is the final energy orbital in calcium. So since this is an s orbital, its shape will be spherical three in a three-dimensional model. But since this is just on a two-dimensional paper, its shape will be best represented by a circle like this. Okay, so uh, part B asks uh, to write the equation for the thermal decomposition of calcium nitrate. So calcium nitrate, it's CaNO3, 2. So 2 over here because NO3 has a charge of negative 1. Calcium has a charge of positive 2. So to balance that out, the formula will be CaNO3, whole 2. So when you thermally decompose it, you will be supplying heat. And then you will end up with calcium oxide. So yeah, basically, in most cases, when you decompose something which contains oxygen, a uh, salt which contains oxygen, you will end up with an oxide of it. And in addition to that, you will be getting NO2. And you will also be getting oxygen. So balancing this out you have two atoms of nitrogen over here so two so you've got one two times two four so and you've got six atoms of oxygen over here so it will be one over two suggest which of the group two nitrates calcium magnesium or radium requires the highest temperature to decompose so what we know is that for carbonates and nitrates uh, when you go down the group the anion will get more distorted and because of that it requires more energy to decompose so more energy to decompose means more temperature to decompose so the order would be calcium requires the least temperature and radium requires the highest temperature so this would be radium And so, yeah, the reason would be thermal stability, increases uh, down the group. So predict what you would observe when aqueous radium chloride is added to aqueous sodium sulfate. So yeah, uh, most probably what we would see over here would be an exchange of the ions like a double displacement reaction. And you would end up with radium sulfate and sodium chloride. So we know that sodium chloride, it's soluble in water because it's basically salt water. Seawater, you can see seawater, you don't have any solids over there. So you would not be observing sodium chloride. Meanwhile, radium sulfate that is insoluble in water. So you would be seeing white precipitates 
of radium sulfate. So 2512 magnesium is an isotope of magnesium. Determine the number of protons and neutrons in an atom of 2512 magnesium. So in a notation like this, over here you would have the atomic number, over here you would have the mass number, and this over here is the symbol. So we know that the atomic number and the number of protons is the same thing, so this would be 12. Now, number of protons plus the number of neutrons equals the mass numbers, which is 25 in this case. So the number of neutrons would be 13. State the full electronic configuration of an atom of 12 magnesium. So since it has 12 protons and it's an atom, not an ion, the number of protons and electrons are equal. So the electronic configuration would be 1s2, 2s2. We've gotten four electrons so far. Uh, 2p6, so that would be 12 electrons. So 1s2. No, that would be 10 electrons, and then 3s2, so 12 electrons in total. Question E, a sample of magnesium contains three isotopes, 25, 26, and X. So the percentage abundance of three isotopes is shown in table 1.1. Okay, the relative atomic mass is calculated by comparing the average masses of isotopes of an element to the unified atomic mass unit. So what is the unified atomic mass unit? So it's basically a unit of mass, which is equivalent to the mass of a twelfth of a carbon-12 isotope. So yeah, the unit of mass equivalent to one twelfth of the mass of a C12 atom. Calculate the mass of X. Use the data for um, table 1.1 and AR of magnesium 24.31 in your calculation. So basically what we have over here is that you've got 78.99 percentage of X, 10% of uh, magnesium 25 and 11.1% uh, 0.01% of magnesium 26. So these three isotopes, they constitute uh, a natural sample of magnesium. So the relative atomic mass over here, 24.31, uh, that's the average of all of these. So 24.31 equals 78.99 percent so percent means over 100 times x that's not the best symbol to, uh, to represent it but still um 10.00 over 100 times 25 plus 11.01 .01 over 100 times 26, okay, okay, my bad. You're supposed to use the mass which is given over here. Times 24.99. And this would be times 25.98. So if you do the calculations properly, you will end up with an expression which gives x equals uh, 23.99. So you might be tempted to round this off to 24.00, but you have to remember that all of the raw data and figures, so you should give the mass of x to four significant figures. So the mass of x is 23.99. So state one similarity and one difference in the properties of these isotopes of magnesium. 
So basically, all of these have the same electronic configuration. So that's a similarity. And this leads to similar chemical properties. So what this means is that suppose you react something with magnesium 25 or magnesium 26, the reaction which you observe will be identical. Like there won't be any difference just because of the increase in mass. However, uh, because of the different number of neutrons, different number of neutrons, you have different mass. So different physical properties. So what sort of physical properties we're talking about are like factors like density, factors like it's um, boiling point, melting point. So what happens is that since magnesium 26 is heavier than magnesium 25, magnesium 26 is gonna be a bit more dense than magnesium 25. Like suppose you can take the case of normal water H2O and heavy water D2O. So like D2O, it's basically deuterium. So yeah, what happens is that say you have gotten 100 liters of H2O and 100 liters of D2O. If you weigh 100 liters of H2O and 100 liters of D2O, you will find that the mass of 100 liters of D2O is going to be greater than the mass of 100 liters of H2O. So that's the kind of physical property or physical differences that we are talking about. Magnesium NG burns in oxygen O2. The activation energy for this reaction is positive 148 kilojoules per mole. State one observation when magnesium burns in oxygen. So yeah, we all have seen stuff like magnesium ribbons burning. So obviously it would be a bright white flame. Okay, on figure 1.1, sketch a reaction pathway diagram for the reaction that occurs when magnesium burns in oxygen. Uh, label the diagram to show the enthalpy change and the activation energy Ea for the reaction. Okay, so, so what happens is that you see a bright white flame when you burn oxygen. So burn magnesium and oxygen so say you've got a magnesium ribbon and like you've got oxygen which is like basically present in the atmosphere so you uh you light the magnesium ribbon so you lighting the magnesium ribbon is basically providing the magnesium ribbon with the initial energy the activation energy which you needed for the reaction to take place and after you've uh you've supplied the activation energy, then the reaction will just take place on its own. So you have gotten bright flames. So that means that heat is being released to the surrounding in the form of the flame. So heat is being released to the surrounding. Therefore, it's an exothermic reaction. So what happens is that you start with the reactants over here. And then you've got an activation energy. And since it's an exothermic reaction, the energy of the products is going to be in a lower level. So this is going to be the activation energy, Ea. So the difference between the enthalpy of the products, I'm sorry, I mean the reactants. the reactants and the products. So over here, this is going to be your enthalpy change. So we've 
doing all of this. Okay, so label the diagram to show the enthalpy change. It will be pointed downwards because the products are below delta H and the activation energy for the reaction. Okay. Cold water reacts slowly with a piece of magnesium to produce bubbles of hydrogen. Cold water reacts rapidly with burning magnesium to produce uh, hydrogen in an explosive mixture. Explain why the rate of cold water with burning magnesium is greater. So, yeah. Um, basically, burning magnesium... Uh, as we've just talked, it's an exothermic process, so it releases energy. Okay, so who gets this energy? So the surrounding gets it, and who's in the surrounding? Other reactants, other molecules which are reacting. So they absorb the energy. Their kinetic energy increases. So greater energy, greater speed of the molecule. So the probability that they are going to have an effective collision increases and because of which the rate of reaction is greater so yeah releases energy energy absorbed by other molecules other reactant molecules and that leads to greater frequency of successive collisions. Nitrogen molecules N2 contains two atoms attracted to each other by a triple covalent bond. Describe how the triple covalent bond forms in a N2 molecule. Refer to orbital overlap and hybridization in your answer. Okay. So basically, um, each nitrogen atom is sp hybridized. And so, yeah, and we have among these uh, three covalent bonds, we have one sigma bond and two pi bonds. So sigma bonds are formed by head-on overlap of orbitals. Meanwhile, pi bonds are formed by sideways or lateral overlap of orbitals. So basically, um, when you've got a hybridized orbital, which is like this. Okay, so I'm not the best artist, so whatever. Okay, so yeah, when they overlap this side facing this side, so end on end, you will get a sigma bond, which is formed by the head on overlap, the end on end overlap between orbitals. Meanwhile, if you've gotten the orbitals kind of like this, sideways, they will overlap on top of each other laterally. So yeah, you'll have one of the orbital over here and the other overlaps right on top of it and that forms pi bonds. Nitrogen oxides NO2 and NO are produced in internal combustion engines. Release of these chemicals, of these gases into atmosphere leads to formation of photochemical smog. Outline how nitrogen oxides are involved in photochemical smog. So yeah, basically what happens is that these nitrogen oxides, oxides react with the unburnt hydrocarbons in the engine so like i suppose it's a gasoline engine or a diesel engine or whatever hydrocarbon based fuel it runs so like suppose there are unburnt 
hydrocarbons in there. So the nitrogen oxides, they are going to react with those. And then they form pan. So what is pan? Pan stands for peroxyacetyl nitrate. So these are a group of compounds which are responsible for photochemical smog. Construct an equation to demonstrate how a catalytic converter reduces the amount of nitrogen oxide gases released into an into the atmosphere. Okay, so basically what a catalytic converter does is that it takes the nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide and converts it to CO2, uh, two molecules of CO2 plus nitrogen. Okay, so this is in the case of nitrogen oxide. Meanwhile, if you've got nitrogen dioxide, then it's going to be NO2 plus CO. This is going to produce CO2 plus N2. Uh, balancing it out, it's going to be half over here and two times over here. Anyways, you can write any of these two reactions. They just want one equation. So nitrogen is very unreactive. It is difficult to make ammonia, NH3, directly from its elements, but it can be made from ammonium chloride. Identify a reagent and the conditions required to make ammonia from ammonium chloride. So yeah. Um, ammonia, it's a weak base, and ammonium chloride, it's formed when the reaction of ammonia and HCl, that forms NH4Cl. So yeah, weak base, strong acid, acidic salt. So you react an acidic salt with a strong base you end up with the previous weak base and a neutral salt at the end. So basically what we need is a strong base over here. So any group one hydroxide, so yeah, we could use NaOH, KOH, even group two hydroxides like CaOH whole two, any of these work. Uh, 25 cm cube of 0.1 mole per dm cube. Hydrochloric acid is added to a beaker and its pH is recorded. 50 cm cube of 0.1 uh, mole per dm cube of ammonia is added to HCl in 5 cm cube portions. The pH of the mixture is monitored until all ammonia is added. HCl is a strong bronzed Lowry acid. So let's see. First of all, we need to define what a bronsted Lowry acid is. A bronsted Lowry acid is an acid which donates protons. So, yeah. So, a bronsted Lowry acid is a compound. Okay, I don't like this color. It's a compound which completely dissociates in an aqueous phase. And donates protons. So ammonia is a weak base. Construct an equation that shows the behavior of ammonia as a weak bronzed Lowry base when dissolved in water. So we dissolve ammonia in water, okay. So what does a bronzed Lowry base do when it's dissolved in water? Its job is to accept protons. So over here, we will have water as the proton donor or the acid and ammonia as the base. Okay, so yeah, water is going to be donating one of its protons to ammonia. So ammonia receives a proton, so it will be NH4 plus, plus because the proton has a plus charge. And then water has donated its proton, so it will be OH minus. So yeah, this is the behavior of ammonia as a bronzed Lowry base in an aqueous phase. 
On figure 2.1, sketch a graph to show the pH which occurs when HCl is titrated with ammonia as described in D. So you start with 25 cm cube of 0.1, uh, 0.1 mole per dm cube of HCl. Okay. And then you've got 50 cm cube of 0 0.10 mole per dm cube of ammonia. So the pH of this is kind of going to be around over here. Okay, so the volume of ammonia added. So you've gotten 50 cm cube over here. So the reaction between HCl and ammonia is a one is to one reaction stoichiometrically, which produces NH4Cl. So yeah, for 25 cm cube of uh, hydrochloric acid, you need 25 cm cube of ammonia to reach an equivalent level. So but since this is a strong, it's an acidic salt, the pH is going to be kind of around over here. So yeah, this is going to be over here. And then at the end, you've added 50 cm cube of ammonia and the pH is not going to be above because ammonia is a weak base. It's kind of going to be around the 8-9 range. So basically just connect the dots now. Wait, okay, that didn't quite look good. And it's going to rise above. Okay, so this is how your pH is going to change when HCl is titrated with ammonia. Liquids that contain molecules of tea smell like lemons. Molecules of tea exist as a pair, pair of stereoisomers. Name the type of stereoisomerism shown by molecules of T. Explain your answer. So the type of stereoisomerism that T shows, okay, so we've got two options. It's going to be geometric or optical. So let's see if we can have geometric isomerism over here. So for that, we need carbon dull bonded to carbon and to have different substituents. We've got a carbon dull bonded to carbon over here, but they don't have different substituents. It's a methyl group CH3 over here and a CH3 over here. So no geometric isomerism for us. Okay, so let's check out if there is going to be an optical isomerism. So this is not a chiral carbon. It doesn't have four different substituents. This is not a chiral carbon either because of the same reason. So let's see over here. You've got an H over here and H over here. So this is not going to be a chiral carbon either. The same for this. Meanwhile, for this one, you've got a methyl group over here. This group towards its right side, a hydrogen downwards, and a whole another group to the left. So, yep, this is a chiral carbon. And meanwhile, this is not a chiral carbon either. And this is not a chiral carbon. Okay, so yeah. This. This one over here is, I, is our chiral carbon. So the type of stereoisomerism which T shows is optical isomerism. Uh, uh, because one of the carbon has four different substituents. Bonded. Okay, so two 
Organic products are produced when a sample of tea is heated under reflux with excess acidified concentrated KMnO4. So this is going to be an oxidizing agent. So what happens is that, okay, so hot acidified concentrated KMnO4, it's going to oxidize this molecule. So over here, you've got an aldehyde. This is going to change into a carboxylic group. Meanwhile, this double bond over here, it's going to rupture. You're going to have an oxygen over here, an oxygen over here. And so it's going to be an aldehyde this side. This is going to be a carboxylic acid. This is just going to be as it is. But then the KMnO4 is going to keep on acting on the aldehyde and change this to a carboxylic acid too. So your organic product number one, it's going to be this molecule over here, which formed by the rupture over here. And the other molecule is this. So yeah. I hope I got the structure correct. Yep, so this is the organic product number two. Figure 3.2 shows two reactions of T. Identify a suitable reagent for reaction number one. So let's see what happens in reaction number one. So you've got an aldehyde group over here. It changes to an alcohol. So what is happening is that it's being reduced. So what can you use to reduce an aldehyde? You can either use... Um, NABH4 or LIALH4, whatever you want. So let's just write NABH4. You could write LIALH4 if you wanted, anything you want. Identify the reagent and conditions needed for reaction two. So in reaction two, we, we see that. Um, uh, OH was added to one end and hydrogen was added to another end. So what you came up with was two different products. So over here, you this is an addition reaction. So what are the reagents you needed? It's basically steam and phosphoric acid, which is a catalyst. So the thing is that uh, this is an addition reaction and the major product is the one with the higher e yield. So what determines the higher yield? Okay, so according to the Markovnikov's rule, when you're adding uh, a reagent to an alkene, the hydrogen will uh, get bonded to the carbon which has the highest number of hydrogens already bonded. Meanwhile, the OH is going to be bonded to the other one. But over here, we need to explain this, our answer, and we just cannot simply say because of the Markovnikov rule. So what happens is that um, when you're adding uh, to this over here, so the one which has a more stable intermediate is going to have a higher yield. So you, you are going to end up with a carbocation intermediate. So either the carbocation is going to form this side or this side. So if the carbocation forms on this side, it has gotten three carbon atoms to reduce the effect of the charge. So this is going to be a, ter uh, a tertiary carbocation if it were on this side. And if it were this side, it would just be a secondary carbocation. So a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary carbocation. So because of that, Q is the more stable one because it would have a tertiary carbocation intermediate. So yeah, Q is, has a greater yield.
because it has a more stable tertiary carbocation intermediate. So separate samples of Q and R are added to separate test tubes containing acidified K2Cr2O7 and heated. Okay, oxidizing agent again. So predict the observations for each test tube. Explain your answers in terms of functional groups present in Q and R. Okay, so this is going to be oxidizing these. So over here, you have gotten a third degree alcohol, a tertiary alcohol. So tertiary alcohols, they are immune to oxidizing agents. So nothing's going to change over here. But then you have a aldehyde over here. This aldehyde is going to change into a carboxylic acid. So yeah, Q is going to be oxidized at least at this end. So the same for R. This is going to be oxidized to a carboxylic acid. Meanwhile, over here, you have a secondary alcohol. So what does a secondary alcohol oxidize to? It's going to oxidize into a ketone. Yeah, so Q has CHO group. It oxidizes uh, to COOH. R has CHO, same stuff. And it also has a secondary alcohol group, which oxidizes to A ketone. So what do we observe? Okay, so we observe that the color of the test tube with Q, it changes from orange to green. And we also see that with R because both of these molecules are getting oxidized. So yeah, that's our answer. When PCL5 solid is added to separate samples of Q and R at room temperature, both react vigorously. Complete the equation shown in figure 3.4 to describe the reaction that occurs when R reacts with PCL5. So PCL5, so the function of PCL5 is to add a chlorine group. So in our case, what happens is that basically it's going to change this OH into a Cl group. So we would end up with Cl over here. So we also have some other products which are going to be HCl and POCl3. Suggest why samples of Q and R must be dried before PCL5 is added. Include a relevant equation to support your answer. So yeah, um, basically PCL5 uh, gets hydrolyzed by water. Water. So uh, the reaction which takes place is that PCL5 5 plus H2O will produce POCl3 plus 2HCl. So since PCl5 gets hydrolyzed by water, it is necessary for our samples of Q and R to be dried so that the PCl5 doesn't change to POCl3 and the reaction doesn't even take place where our sample gets chlorinated. So question four. Um, most probably this is our final question. So compound V is a liquid. V contains 77.2% of carbon, 11.4% of hydrogen, and 11.4% of oxygen by mass. 
V has a relative molecular mass of 280. Calculate the molecular formula of V. So yeah, V has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So the percentage is 77.2% of carbon by mass, 114 of hydrogen, and also 11.4% of oxygen. So the mass of carbon would be 12. So dividing this, we would get 6.433. The mass of hydrogen is 1, so we get 11.4. And the mass of oxygen is 16, so 0 0.7125. So now we are going to divide these numbers by the lowest number present here, which is 0 0.7125. And dividing those, we will end up with 9.5. Over here, it's going to be 16. And so 0 0.7195 divided by itself is going to be 1. So our empirical formula, OK, we could just round this off to 9. So it would be C9H16O. So the mass of this is 140. Meanwhile, the mass of our actual compound is 280. So 280 divided by 140 equals 2. So our actual compound has got twice the amount of these stuffs compared to our empirical formula. So our molecular formula is going to be C9 times 2, H16 times 2, O1 times 2, which is C18, H32, O2, okay. So this is our molecular formula. C18H32O2. V contains two types of functional group, a carboxylic acid and an alkene. Describe a chemical test and observation which confirms the presence of a carboxyl functional group. So yeah, a carboxyl functional group. So that's the functional group which makes it an acid. So since it's an acid, you could literally just react it with, um, say, some carbonate or bicarbonate salt. So it's basically like the reaction uh, which you can see at home when you take some vinegar, add some baking soda to it, which is sodium bicarbonate, and you see bubbles uh, coming up, which are basically bubbles of carbon dioxide. So we could literally do the same over here because like even vinegar, it's a carboxylic acid, it's ethanoic acid. So yeah, you could replicate that experiment for any carboxylic acid. So what happens over here is that you could just take some carbonate salt, bicarbonate salt, let's just say um, add some sodium bicarbonate to a test tube with the acid bubbles confirm presence of carboxylic group carboxyl group a 3.196 gram sample of bromine reacts completely with 2.800 gram of V. Calculate how many alkene functional groups are present in one molecule of V. Show your working. So 2.800 grams of V, it's going to be like 2.800 over its molecular mass of 280. This is going to be 0 0.1 mole of V. Meanwhile, 3.196 grams of bromine, it's going to be divided by 159.8. Um, um, that would be 0 0.02 moles of bromine. 
Okay, let me just erase stuff from over here. So yeah, in general, say, so suppose you have an alkene which is like this. If you want to completely react this with bromine, for one mole of an alkene, you would need one mole of bromine. This is because like, so one mole of bromine is going to be Br2, which is going to be Br, Br. And then each of these Br are going to add on to these carbons over here. So in general, the amount of uh, the the amount of bromine which you need is basically represents the proportion of double bonds present. So over here, um, what we could say is that since you need 0 0.02 moles of bromine, you have 0 0.02 moles of double bonds in the 0 0.1 0 0.01 mole sample okay so yeah 0 0.02 moles of double bond in the 0 0.01 mole sample so that would mean we have gotten 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.01 which would be 2 so we have two alkene groups over here so i guess this is our last part w x and y have the same molecular formula okay so you react these with different reagents observations are described so orange precipitate scene so all of these uh, gave a positive test for 2,4-DNPH, which would mean all of these have a carbonyl group. I think so, yeah. State the formula of the yellow precipitate produced when X is added to alkene. So that would be triiodomethane, the yellow precipitate scene. That would be CHI3, triiodomethane. W could be one of four structural isomers. Draw the skeletal formula for two possible structures of W. Describe the type of structural isomerism shown. So the thing with W is that it's C5H10O. It has a carbonyl group. Uh, doesn't give a, doesn't give a positive result over here. So that means no methyl ketone present and no methyl secondary alcohol. It gives a positive uh, result with the Felling's reagent, so that means it has an aldehyde group. Okay, so yeah, it has an aldehyde group, so O. Carbon over here, wait. So it has an aldehyde group, okay. And it has five carbons. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. H, 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 H. Okay, so yeah, basically with W, all we have to do is keep the aldehyde group present. And then we could just make some chain isomers of W. So draw the skeletal formula. One, two, three, so one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, four carbon, five carbon, 
So this is one of these skeletal formulas. And basically we could just take this chain over here and join it over here to form another isomer. So this is another isomer, type of structural isomerism, chain. Figure 5.1 shows the mass spectrum of ketone Z. Um, use the information in figure 5.1 to suggest the formula of the fragments with Me peaks at 29 and 57. Deduce the identity of Z. Okay, so C5H10O. You have a peak at 29. So first of all, the mass of C5H10O is going to be 5 times 1260 plus 10 plus the mass of oxygen is 16. So this is going to be 70, 86. Okay, so this over here, it's the peak of this one. So 86 over here. So this over here is... 57, this is 29. So 57 plus 29 equals 86. So basically it broke in a region over there. So this is a ketone. So it would be COC HHH. So I mean, this chain could continue. So basically R and R over here. So one of these has an oxygen with them and the other doesn't. So 29. So the common fragments with uh, peaks at 29, that is C2H5 plus. So 2 times 12, 24, 24 plus 5, 29. So C2H5 plus. So now C5H10O minus C2H5, that leaves you with C3H5O and then a mandatory plus charge because it's a molecular ion. So yeah, this is our Me C3H5O identity of Z. So the identity of Z would be So first of all, we have this peak over here. So C, C, H5. And then you have gotten three over here. So you could just say that you have C, O, C, 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 H3, H, 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 H. So this is a feasible formula for Z over here because it just fragmented over here. You've got the peak which so showed 29. You've got the peak which showed 57, the ion which showed 57. So Z could basically be one, two, three, penton three own. And that would be the completion of this paper, um, paper 2-1 from May, June 2022. Uh, back to you. Thank you so much, Sarvesh, for your time. And we hope you had a good understanding of this paper. Uh, the next slide will have our social media handles that you could follow. Thank you and have a nice day.